Thanks, Magli, and thanks to Teresa, who's not here, but she would be here, but she's doing other things today. And um, thank you for uh, being part of this presentation. And as always, with these types of topics, we are um, unwilling participants at times. And as somebody's already indicated, that consent is a very important part of the way that we interact in our society. Um, I'm here at SAE Creative Institute in Perth in Western Australia and for the people that are online and seeing this in the future, uh, welcome also. Uh, it's the 5th of July 2019 and my name is Alexander Hayes and I'm here wearing a little orange clip camera which is at the moment absolutely completely an RPMP commission. <laughs> <laughs> for the ease and well-being of those people in the room who have never seen one of these little clip cameras. Uh, they're prolific around the world, in different parts of the world, and this has been the focus of my PhD research for quite some time, almost a decade. So, as you can see there and can read, my name is Alexander Hayes. I'm a PhD candidate through the University of Wollongong, which I, I can highly recommend as being an incredibly good university to attend. Uh, and also, if you'd ever like to go to Helsinki, uh, Alto University is an amazing place to be as well. I've been a visiting researcher with that university for quite some time. But today, I'd like to firstly <coughs> acknowledge that we are on country here, and I acknowledge that this presentation occurred, occurring, on the country of the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation in Perth, Western Australia. I wish to acknowledge past, present and future leaders of the Wajak people and respect their continuing culture and their contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. And here we have the consent. But before we move on to consents, what I would like, if I could please, could I have somebody nominate themselves <laughs> as a scribe, a facilitator as a scribe, and that person's um, duty is simply to distribute these amazing Sharpie pens, which have uh, fully charged with ink. And on this little pad here, I've written a prompt. And it, said, it says, privacy is. And what I'd like people to do is to take the first prompt and with one word, or perhaps two, fill in what they believe privacy means to them. And if you can pass this around until we get such um, enough of these to fill in slide 52, which isn't yet present and will be in the future. So can I have somebody that would be willing to uh, take these off the table here and these pens and distribute them in the room? And while I'm speaking, please feel free to answer your text messages. Please feel free to FaceTime if you wish to. And please feel free to email whatever it happens to be that you need to do in your digital realm. So I'm not, not uh, interrupted by you attending to what you would like to do. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. So just if you could pass around a pen yes, and yeah, you, in any way you wish. Yeah. Thank you. And what we'll do at the very conclusion, after I have finished uh, looking at this particular uh, topic with you, we're going to assemble those onto a 16 by 9 frame and we're going to take a shot and we're going to insert that slide into this presentation and in the future other people around the world will be able to see what your contribution is today. In that. Most importantly, consent. This presentation is being recorded and all of your audio interactions will be captured via the invited speaker's microphone. If you wish to speak, I am recording myself in relation to myself. If you do not wish to be recorded, please do not contribute to the presentation. But if you do, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, if you do not wish to be visually recorded on the camera, which is here to, your, to my left, uh, please do not pass between myself and the exit door. Although, if there's an emergency, you must exit via the exit door. So we will turn that off before you exit. Uh, nor are you required to interact audibly with me, the invited speaker. You're not required to. The entire presentation, oh, here we go, sorry, I'm losing my track here. Uh, the entire presentation between commencement and the cessation of this slide presentation will be recorded. It'll be edited, and it's going to be broadcast online as a digital presentation 
on the Invited Speakers YouTube channel, that's my own, via the internet. Your subject rights and privacy are important. And the Invited Speaker invites you to discuss this topic further at a time and place which respects both parties' personal, community, national and global human rights. Skip. So how many of us, with our smartphones, add a new app, find a privacy accord and press skip? Fast forward. And if we press no, what happens to our apps? They don't work. So we're always pressing yes, um, unlike swiping right or left, we simply say yes. So this, so this um, presentation is to look at these particular topics and concerns and the things that I've been looking at through this particular study. Now today I had approved, but in actual fact the topic for the presentation mirrors that of what the PhD presentation is about. The socio-ethical implications of body-worn computers and it's an ethnographic study. That means it's looking at humans and people and what their accounts are of these particular types of technologies, particular surveillance. I conducted 50 interviews with international leaders, engineering, policing, surveillance studies, national security, cyber crimes, information systems, education and human computing industries. So that's the key people that I'm looking at. This is me through that period of 10 years in all different ways and means, engaging with different communities around this particular topic, socio-ethical implications of body -worn computers. The key themes that are coming out of that study over 10 years of engaging with people around Australia are privacy, security, implications, control, power and place. They're, a big, they're the big things that happen. But there's also these ideas of care, convenience, and control amongst there as well. And I'd like to actually engage with you around what that particular topic might be and see if we can um, prompt um, some discussion about this towards the end of the, the presentation around how things are for you. Now those little tags, are they getting around? Yeah, great, excellent. So please pass them around and write what you believe privacy might mean for you as a person. Principally, in terms of research, that's what I've been looking at. Whether these technologies are to the benefit of us in society or whether they are to the detriment. But of course we know that life is not quite like that, is it? Life is a little bit grey. It's not whether it's beneficial or whether it's detrimental. In fact, there are many, many other grey areas in between all of that. And I'm sure some of you are very, very across what that might mean in terms of people who uh, feel very um, happy with the fact that they are being surveilled and others that are not. And others that are ambivalent, don't really care, don't really know. In actual fact, they would like to know when they find out a little bit about what they don't know. So, I put it, in actual fact, every one of you are the product. You are the product. You are the product of what we're creating as a society, how we're shaping this society, and what we're doing within the society to divide ourselves up into separate groups. And how those groups work in relation to how our communities run, most importantly how we behave in relation to the fact that we have become the product. So, what I'd like to do is introduce three parameters to the discussion. And if you can please think about what those three parameters might mean ahead of time and position yourself as centre to the discussion, central to the conversation that's happening on around you all the time in this community and society at this very present moment. So essentially, we're well aware of the fact that if we look around the architectures of our environments and in our society, we have surveillance. Surveillance is generally what people understand the main topic is for when we look at cameras and when we look at other people shooting uh, photos and images of us or perhaps when we are engaging in activity and we feel that somebody's taking information away from us. We understand that to be surveillance. What I would like to posit is an actual fact. There are three other facets 
to the fact that in actual fact how you have become the product and I'd like to introduce those to you and I encourage you to look further than this room today in this interactive presentation which you can get a copy of you can click on the 50 links that are in the back of it and find a whole range of information that might be of interest to you. Surveillance is the first parameter and if you're interested in surveillance you can always talk or engage with David Lyon and he's from the Surveillance Studies Centre Queen's University in Canberra. He's got a lot to say on this whole topic around looking, watching and how surveillance might, what it might mean for you as human beings in this context and if you wish to there is a massive group of people at the moment where you can gain degrees masters and PhDs in surveillance studies alone just looking at surveillance as a topic the second parameter which I posit as being important is this which is known as surveillance or surveillance and surveillance is essentially a another parameter which allows us to consider the fact that surveillance in its in its essence is about oversight and looking down on us it's oversight surveillance being under violence from below so we might think that in actual fact if we start shooting back on what's being shot down on us and our information being taken away the act of being in that civic having that civic right is known as surveillance and that means that you have the control and power also to control what's being shot about you essentially a lot of people think about if I use my phone and I'm using my camera and my audio I can shoot back on the system that's shooting back down on me and that's known as surveillance and the individual who I've been working with for quite some time on this topic is none other than Steve Mann, Professor Steve Mann. So this particular camera here is the beginnings of the next levels as to where we're going to find ourselves in humanity in a very, very short period of time. And if you've heard of Apple Watch, you'll soon hear of Apple Glass. And at the very beginning of that cycle of how we wear the computer and how we become the camera, essentially this man has been at the very beginnings of that cycle as an inventor and from this uh, body-worn computer, head-worn computer that he is wearing which is an augmented reality is the beginnings of another level of all mediated reality that means that he is training what he sees through computer vision and I'll explain what computer vision might look like as we go further into the presentation here. And you get an understanding as to who Steve Mann might be in this whole picture and story. Now there's a lot on the internet about Steve Mann and he's, he's kind of known as the father of wearable computing. People kind of debate that because there's a lot of other people that have been involved in wearable computing far prior to Steve Mann but I invite you to go to much of the internet has a lot to do with Steve Mann's presentations on that topic. Another individual that I've worked with quite closely as well has been Gordon Bell. So I'd invite you to have a look at what Gordon Bell might have been doing with this device that he's wearing here. And this particular device here, which I wore for quite some time in different social contexts to discover what the actual chilling effect might be on other people as well. Now Gordon Bell and I met at this conference which I conducted in Toronto can see there's an audience there in the Grand Hall, there's Steve at the presentation and we looked a lot at the time how G plus and, and that was in relation to um, this concept of valence. The valence is the overarching domain so we have to remember we've got surveillance, surveillance, but I need to introduce two other parameters that we haven't quite got to yet. Let's have a look at the third and important parameter. Now when I go to the shop I know that every transaction that I'm making with my card is being tracked. I know that the products that I'm buying, my third, my, my interactions in the shop and what I buy and what I purchase, the data that they know about me is being sold onto third parties and the third parties are then making me the product because they want to sell me more product in a certain way. 
So the data is disappearing and the data is known as data valence. That means that under this, arch, under this overarching level of valence, we have three parameters that are coming together and they are starting to surround us in relation to who we are, in relation to what other people are getting of us. So if we look at who invented that concept and term, essentially Roger Clark, who is Professor Roger Clark from Australian National University, uh, he is a now existing chair of the Australian Privacy Foundation in Australia. Essentially he looked at way back whether or not under Bob Hawke we should introduce an Australia card. And some people in this room might remember this whole concept that they wanted to log us by a number and they wanted to make our ID cards, not like our driver's license with a face and a name on it, they wanted to give us a facial recognition photo plus a number. Back in the 1980s. Essentially, now we have many numbers attached to our faces, down credit cards and so on, all attached to who we are. So the third parameter is enshrined by this whole concept around control, convenience and care. And most people will tell you that uh, it's okay for me to exist in public environment because I feel safer that surveillance exists to be able to show authorities that I was somewhere at a certain time. Therefore, with great care, I understand that people are there to look after me. Other people will posit an actual fact that if, it's, if I drive into a, a car park and I don't have to press to get a ticket any further, but there's a camera there, I will give up the ticket in order for the camera to take pictures of me and I'm okay with that. And that convenience, as my supervisor advises, is very much around control. It's very much around if we give up our idea of who we are in relation to care, and we do that through this nature of convenience, freebies, free applications, free social media, free interactions, we give up control, ultimately we give up control of who we are. And that's that person there. Katina Michael, Professor Katina Michael, she also looks around how these particular types of technologies, where they're heading. What is the general trajectory for where these technologies are heading? At the moment we have te technologies, this body worn computer here, well, this is a handheld computer to some people, body-worn computer to some other people. What's the trajectory and where are these heading? And her partner, husband, Dr. M.G. Michael, says that uber-valence is the ultimate trajectory for where these valences are heading. And that's an omnipresent electronic surveillance that's facilitated by technology that makes it possible to embed those surveillance devices in the human body. So essentially the signal or the channel that's being um, constructed for us is that according to this man here and according to many other people, the trajectory for technologies of what we currently have as handheld or wearable will now be in the future, in the short future, be implanted in who we are. That means that we don't get a choice in the nature of when or how we're implanted. And for some people it's, it's a, very much based in science fiction, because we see it a lot in science fiction. For other people who are tracking this particular types of technology, they're examining this from a social fiction. And they're examining how quickly science fiction writers are talking with engineers and how quickly these implantable technologies are happening across the world. And Essentially, this is the first part of where it happens in terms of the choice to have technologies implanted in your body. Essentially, there are many people around the world who are having technologies implanted in their hands in order for them to pass through various environments, pay wave, passport control, buses, operating their car, door locks, any interaction even shaking hands with another individual. 
in passing information and for that block system open, shut, on, off, to actually work in the world. There are many people that are choosing at this very present point in time to have RFID technologies and other technologies being embedded in their own human body, their own human form. And for some people that's just the most amazing but scary idea that no longer do I have to have a wallet and no longer do I have to have a credit card, no longer do I actually have to have a phone any further. I have become the technology and it's inside me. And there are many, many, many people around the world already heading in this direction. And if you wish to take a choice and make that choice at this very point in time, you can simply go to biohacks.tech and away you go. You can order the kits online and in fact they have implanting parties around the world. They have whole conferences and they have whole gigs around music, community, implanting. That is the mandate as to where these people are heading with technologies. And it's all around convenience, care, and essentially control. I also happen to be the author of, of ubervalence.com. And over 10 years of writing, tagging, categorizing content, these are the sorts of things that are filtering up in terms of the importance of concepts and themes that appear out of that site. This is an automatic um, site that generally filters things to the top in terms of their occurrence and what the importance are of topics. And above all, the key theme that's emerging is this whole big thing called privacy. What does privacy mean? As some people have written down there, we'll soon find out. Essentially, if we switch the three parameters, we quickly see how relevant this is in relation to the current topics that we see in our media, particularly Australian media, around how corporations who have a great deal of influence over government also involve the public in facilitating this particular type of valence and using these parameters to see us in that whole picture. So this is what I posit we're currently immersed in as a humanity. This is, for some people, a very dystopic picture, very worrying for who they are as individuals. But there are other alternatives to this, of course. We have a choice there. And we have to have a choice because uh, I'm going to bring three <coughs> case studies just briefly to you so you can have a look at those in terms of this context here we are, where we are today. Has everybody kind of visited Fremantle at some point in time? Most people know what Frio is, yeah, markets, know where to go to get to the post office in Frio, people know how to get to Myers, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, a few things have changed in Fremantle and one thing has changed markedly in the last year. Case study one, right to pass. I invite you to go and visit 142 High Street Fremantle and have a quick look at what exists amongst the second hand store, post office, uh, Centrelink office, a um, uh, uh, couple of shops and then around the side, not quite sure what's actually happening around the corner. 142 High Street Fremantle. 142 High Street Fremantle is located, you've probably been to the fly by night, I know I have in the past, and it's opposite Good Sammy, so you're probably going to find that quite quickly. But if you wander down High Street and you're on this side of the road and you look back at that building, you are going to observe the following. There are no less than 32 cameras on that one building which is no bigger than this room. I'm kidding you not. It's not much bigger than this room in terms of the whole capacity of the building. Right? It's in the centre, the absolute centre of Fremantle. And in the centre of Fremantle, you'll, not, you'll notice in this building here these types of uh, fixed position cameras 
and also further around on the side you'll notice that there are rotating gimbal cameras which can rotate and take 180 degrees this way and 180 degrees this way. But the most important part about this picture that we have here for Australian people, for the, for the culture and for the, the citizenship of this particular country, is this particular notice that we have on the left here. This is sort of setting a precedent for where we're heading. This um, unknown corporation who are unanswerable and who would not answer my inquiries as a researcher have indicated that this is private property. We all understand what private means, privacy and private in terms of property, especially a physical self, our privacy of our own self as people. This, this particular institution is saying that in order for us to actually pass the building anywhere within the range of where the cameras are at, that we have to have permission and it's subject to the control of the owner that we pass that building. Now can you think, if you could think of any other example in Australia, I'd be very, in I'd be very interested to know if anybody knows of any other property in Australia that has a sign like that in relation to what they're conducting in this particular vicinity of Fremantle. Is there anybody that might have any idea of any properties like that in Australia? No, lots of shaking hands because I haven't yet come across them. And I find this is setting a precedent which in actual fact has <coughs> large implications for the way that we operate in Australian society. So, let's look at case study two. And this is called Perth City Watch, Perth Central Australia. And the main topic of Perth City Watch is SAE. So as you stepped in SAE today, you'll have noticed how many cameras there are when you walk, walk into the building. Now, have you counted them? Many. Okay, so when you walk into SAE, you'll notice that within SA Institute, there are a range of four-way cameras, meaning that no matter which way you go, you're going to be tracked. Okay, and you're assigned a temporary entry number when you enter the property, and that assigned temporary entry number of who you are is then gradually refined until such time as they can identify you within the parameters of this building. All four ways. And this is a Google map, essentially, of SA Institute. Everybody knows this. We've all either walked this way, kept the train that way, park air car, and so on. So this is one way of thinking about the fact that this building itself is surveillant, yes. and that your pictures and images and what you potentially could be saying are also being stored in relation to who you are. That's the nature of being in this particular facility. And in being in this facility, we also have to think about that we're also under another view of that again. So this is a little bit further up, further higher than where we are. So this is Google view, but what I did is I switched on another layer, and this commercial engine that anybody can pay for switches into Google Maps, and it turns on this image parameter, which fixes on objects in there and discerns between objects. That means that it can change between an inanimate object and an animate object, meaning a human being. So on the picture, wherever those red uh, crosses are, this is where humans are standing within the relation to that field of view. And this is in live time. This is not a picture, it's a live version of what's occurring within where we are. So when you step outside the building today, just be aware that there's a little red dot following you around <laughs> until you're out of that field of view into another. This is a commercial engine. It's something you can pay for. Switch them to Google, Google View, turn the app on, and you can see essentially things that are occurring in a certain resolution and over a certain time. This is facilitated by maps of how and who we are through time in relation to where we've been. So that's case two. Now, where we are at the moment in time is that if you have ever visited this institution here, which a few of us have, because we like football, this particular institution here 
has a range of different um, cameras within it in terms of surveillance and control. And the nature of how they wish to ensure that control is maintained in this environment here is that this CCTV uh, network is positioned in order to identify individuals and assign their identification in relation to the individual as they pass into this environment. Now, the person is not aware, not aware that they are being visually tracked in this way. They're not aware of the temporary exit the zone number that they are assigned, and they're not aware that that temporary zone number is attributed to all the other data they may have collected on the in other individual if they are facially recognised in that context of that environment. Now, there's a lot of talk about how, uh, what issues this may have for the way that people interact in Perth, and essentially this has been rolled out and is running. And was there any public consultation in relation to this? Did we participate in having any control or power over this occurring within our community, within our society, with where we live? So this is case two. This is currently where we're at. Then it switched into the suburbs. So in where you live, where you actually are residing, across Perth, a range of other cameras have been not only posited as being maybe of trial value, but have actually been positioned and are running live. Now these are very similar to the others that we were talking about earlier around public facilities, which of course might be the subject to terrorist attacks, might be subject to civil unrest. We can understand those larger domains actually being needing control over mass groups of people. So as we move towards the privacy of our home, what do we find? we find the onset of new technologies and further measures of people who wish to identify people as they pass through or move between different spaces in, in what is known as our suburbs, as we understand the safety and sanctity of our own home. And there's been a lot of issues about complaints as to the lack of the consultation with the people who live in those suburbs in relation to what these other private corporations are getting using this information for about ourselves. And all of this is being watched and being used and being monitored <coughs> by um, an operative program called City Watch. Perth City Watch. Now Perth City Watch is, is a tacit term because the term geographically geolocating Perth is nature of a city, but City Watch exists in most cities across the world. And these watching stations, these, these surveillance oversight individuals and corporations and linked controls with government are around <coughs> monitoring what's occurring within real time, within real spaces, with real people. And the real people are you and me, of course, all of us. We are their product. They get paid to sit, monitor, um, section, uh, alert individuals in real life time. So we have become the product and their, um, the way that they are operating in relation to us is around keeping an eye on what we're doing. But of course, the parameters have to be examined further. And that is, as my research has been looking at, is this. So, the parking officers that you now go and talk to, you'll probably notice now wear a red camera right here. Has anybody seen those on their parking officers? Ah, yes, a few people have. That's good. Good to see some few nods in there. Because these individuals who are humans are wearing a camera which has the capacity for facial recognition and has the capacity for a whole range of other data in terms of geolocation, date, time, and all this sort of data which positions you in relation to the officer. The officer has a number, and the officer is a human. So what I did when I, one day, uh, was parking my car, I noticed there was a parking officer near me wearing one of these red cameras. I've never seen them before. And as a researcher, I was very interested in knowing 
what it was in relation to me that they needed to wear the camera for. So I asked the officer and I interacted with the officer around, is there an issue if I approach you, first of all, because you're wearing a camera? So I'm notioning to the individual that I'm not sure that I can trust you in relation to wearing the camera. That individual said to you, yes, you may approach. So they've been primed to actually respond to that prompt in that way. I approached the person who stood within a three metre gap between myself and where that person is sitting here. And I asked the officer, in wearing this camera, is there anything in particular that I have to you know, be concerned about uh, in relation to me parking my car and paying my ticket? Uh, that individual said no, only if you have a certain range of behaviours that we would then trigger a range of networks around us in relation to our camera. I said, hmm, that's interesting. Do, may I approach you closer? And the, the parking officer was very kind, she was very polite, and she said, yes, you may. And I stood forward a bit further and I said, is it okay if I take my phone out of my pocket and take a photo of you wearing a camera, given that you are taking photos of me? Uh, and she said, no, you may not, because it may end up on social media. And I thought to myself, wow, that's pretty interesting, up on social media. Maybe I want it up on social media, that might be really good. And that individual said, at this point in time, I have to cease any of your further questions in relation to the matter, because if I feel that you are going to question me any further, I'm going to trigger these other cameras around us. And she pointed to the gimbal cameras all around us. And I said, wow, okay. I have to inform you, she said, that we wear these cameras for your security. And I asked, I said one smart ass sort of thing as I left. I said, what am I being protected from? What do I need to be scared of? If you are looking after my safety, what am I actually being afraid of? So what I did was I inquired further, being who I am. And I asked those individuals, whoop, uh, we've got, oh yeah, that's right. I asked those individuals, uh, in this context, is there any other people wearing cameras? Because I hadn't yet realised that at that point in time there was a roll out of the, see this little black box that's on the officer's chest here? This little black box here? This little black box like this? But this one has a different name on it to that one there. And I can't mention that name because if I mention that name, commercially and proprietally, and also, I would probably be sued a huge amount of money for talking about their product and what it actually does. So this particular individual here, oh, it, oh it's interesting that they've got this mute sign here as an individual. That person is a human being and he's an officer and he's an officer of law in Western Australia. And that individual here now wears a black box which contains a camera with facial recognition technology but also a range of artificial intelligence based prompts that go to the officer through their ear and actually can issue arrests electronically by simply looking at the individual with the camera. So if you had an outstanding bench warrant, you were a convicted felon on the, on the fly or something similar, the police officer no longer has discretionary power to say I won't arrest this individual. Or in fact if the person was drunk and sending them home, they can't say that either essentially are compelled to issue a conviction to the individual based on time, date, stamp and their, in, and their actual picture as to where they are. So, if we move to another level. Now, I'm raising this because I think it's of civic concern to who we are as individuals. This individual here uh, sent me to this particular address and asked me to go and visit their safe, safer community based um, uh, information in relation to the matter. And what did I find? I found zero. Can't say it, but we can. I found nothing in relation to this particular matter at all. In fact, they have removed everything in relation to the body worn cameras, which is my particular research area, in relation to our community that we live in here in Perth. And this is the response that I received. 
me, Alexander Hayes, researcher with the University of Wollongong, with this PhD and the rest of it. You began your inquiry with a question about why there is little or no accessible information on the City of Perth website detailing the use, type, intent and governance of body-worn camera technology currently being employed. It's important to realise that it's currently being employed. Most importantly, what they've written here, we are not required to provide this information on our website for public access as the purpose of deploying these body-worn cameras is primarily for our staff safety. That's contrary to what I was told. I was told it was for my safety. In line with our responsibilities guided by the Occupational Health and Safety Act of 1984. Now, what happened in 1984? Does anybody remember ever reading a book that was um, called uh, 1984? Yeah. <laughs> it, this is paradoxical that Health and Safety Act of 1984 happened to be 1984. Yeah? Okay. That's just, that's my, I like to have a, a bit of a giggle about that. But in actual fact, what this is pointing at is the fact that deploying these body worn cameras is to protect them, not us. Okay? And then I find this. Body worn cameras are to be deployed to frontline officers. This is on Saturday, 23rd of March, 2019. I believe that that's the year that we're actually existing in now, 2019. And in this environment of 2019, we hear some information here about statewide rollout of body-worn cameras launched in Perth. So that is how many years later are we being told as a community that these things have actually been rolled out and are being used. And that is indicative very much around the world, around communities where you'll find a complete disconnect between what is occurring in reality, absolute reality, what's occurring in virtual reality, which is on the internet, and then what's occurring in our mixed reality. That means that regulation and law is catching up to where the technology is at. It's not simply the other way around. The technology is governed, and that's the big question around governance, regulation and control, around particularly these types of technologies. So, by this stage, everybody has fallen asleep and nobody has written on the privacy cards and that's fantastic, but exactly, you know what? It's not about me, it's actually about you. So this is where we're heading. Now what I'd like to do is just show you a brief clip to see, if you haven't already seen this, you may have already seen this, to understand this is absolute reality. Now I've got to try and work out if this is going to play, and I don't believe it is because it's not embedded in that framework. So, if you could please write down life inside China status of the state, and in your own time, please go and have a look at this particular YouTube clip. Uh, it did, it's not, for some reason it's not triggering on there, I can't see the play symbol, it's not there. Uh, did you want to open a new tab? No, it's okay. Yeah. The first two minutes, essentially, are the most important part of this particular piece of media. And that is, it's not, I'm not talking about a particular nationhood and the way it operates. You have to be very clear of that. I'm not point, point, pointing out, I'm talking about the technologies and this topic, power, surveillance and control, not around the particular nationhood as to where this particular clip is talking about. But essentially, these technologies are being rolled out in various other parts of the world and are being used to control their populations very, very quickly. And that's occurring right now. So let's have, an let's have a look at an example of what's happening inside the shopping centre of Perth. This is when you go to a, uh, a, a, you know, a supermarket store or something similar. So first of all, you're issued a temporary entry permit number, and there's the temporary entry permit number there. And you'll notice that it's not in English. Okay, and it doesn't much matter which language it's in. Essentially, it's a, a control number. Your facial scan and who you are, 156 pins, or 55 at a basic level, essentially triangulates you, and it allows you, I don't know where this is pointed to, but this, this um, is tracking that individual's path as they've moved through the shopping centre. And you'll see the points as to when they've turned, made new decisions, and perhaps where they've rested and had a kebab or a drink. And they've moved into another store, and as they've moved around that uh, particular physical environment, they're tracked in relation to other people through time. And not only through time, 
but they're also data matched with that individual's ID and what can be scoured and known about that individual. This is a real lifetime tracking machine in any of these major shopping centres at this present point in time. And this is absolute reality. This is a virtual domain that we're working <coughs> and exist in, but this is a live version as to what's occurring within these environments. That's about data valence. Surveillance, oversight, looking at ourselves as subjects and products in relation to their greater framework. And we know them better as this. I know that on my phone, I had maybe 50 or so apps, and every time I said, do you wish to um, use the app in order to be able to um, operate as an individual, I would press yes. And I very rarely read the privacy terms. Now if I scour down, it takes me so long to read the privacy terms, I got very interested in what the privacy terms were, and that was my issue. When you press yes, you're accepting the conditions of that particular application and the corporation that run the application. So we probably know some of these small symbols here, which represent some of those corporations which some of us have become very involved with and very intimate with. And through those intimacy relationships that we have with others and with that corporation, these corporations offer us predominantly a free access to a product and at the end of the day, our data becomes their data. And what they are doing through those applications, they are ranking, sorting and assigning data in order in relation to you. So particu this particular app here is indicating that that individual using this particular application through their health parameters can <coughs> maybe take uh, 72 steps on average per day, per month. Uh, they are gaming for 11 and a half hours on average per day. And that the range of the data and applications they exist with are putting them at a very high threshold of mental incapacity, maybe to the borderline of quite violent actions and behaviour. So therefore, there, that particular app is assigning a high risk that, uh, to that individual, and that application might be health insurance. There may be something quite benign or, diff or supposedly completely different in relation to that individual. But we have to, when we have an issue or a question in this world, where do we go for an answer? The internet. We go to the internet, yeah? And where do we go specifically on the internet? Hi. Okay. So this is what Google says. If you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. But if you really need that kind of privacy, the reality is that search engines, including Google, do retain this information for some time. We know that we re it retains forever. And forever being as long as the internet exists. And it's important, for example, that we're all subject in the United States to the Patriot Act. Act. It is possible that that information could be made available to the authorities. Derek Schmidt, he's the former CEO of Google, who, run, who runs the Google engine. Essentially, we'll go to an American dictionary about ourselves and put all of our search queries and our information about ourselves into that environment. Every keystroke, every search is locked. Everything is retained. And then we have these people. Edward Snow. And Edward says, arguing you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. So that means that we have to, as I see it, we have an obligation as human beings to defend one principle. We only have one key principle to defend in what, who we are as individuals, particularly as people as citizens in this whole world which is quickly going VR, yeah? And then it's going to go from VR into far deeper realms of AR and other. Very quickly. We have to somehow keep our eyes on this. If you don't know what Digital Rights Watch is, that's a very, very strong engine for understanding where things occur within the digital rights of Australians, specifically within this domain of our a terra firma here. 
this particular organisation, if you go in there, there's a stack of stuff about media rights and things in there that are really, really specific to the way to your um, future vocations as to what you want to do in the future and at this present moment. Very important that we understand where we're at, not necessarily in terms of donation, but I'd like to see them put a search function bar right in the front of there to find out if I search for this, this is what I get. I've made that suggestion to them. I think the website's defunct, but that's not the, that's the, not the problem. The main problem is in turning that into a search engine. And if you don't have any luck on that one there, you can always go to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And the EFF are a global action group around looking at this whole idea that you have become a product. This whole idea that surveillance is the power mechanism is controlling the way that we act, the way that we interact, and what other people know about us. And then, if we are keen and willing, we can always volunteer our time to the Australian Privacy Foundation. And the APF, which is a, uh, a really strong organisation historically and contemporaneously, at this very present moment, they protect your rights to not have people arrive at your door without a warrant and film you without consent and ask you to participate in programs which you do not wish to participate in and be warranted to be removed from your premise without being informed nor either any of the people in your household informed you've been removed to go to those other areas or those other places for better education. These people protect us from that type of behaviour occurring in Australia because I believe that privacy is the right to be imperfect. And that is, privacy is the right to be human. And humans are fallible. And we fall apart and we make mistakes. We do all sorts of crazy things. And as my website has at the top of that website, it has a disclaimer at the bottom and it has a warning at the top. Because within my own website itself, it's dangerous. Because <laughs> it shows all the crazy things I did as an artist in my previous life. And it shows all the crazy things I'm going to be involved with in the future. They already know where I'm heading. And they already know where you're heading too. But who are they? It's us. We're the product. Thank you very much.